action. Welcome to another episode of Filmmaker's Focus. I'm Doc Kennedy, and this week's guest is Ella Anderson. We'll get to our conversation with Ella in just a minute. want to give you a quick update of some stuff that's gone on this last week. I had an awesome time at a local filmmakers meetup here in Tacoma. And I want to encourage you guys that if you have meetups in your area, get to them. I mean, it's just a blast to hear what other folks have going on meet other people with similar interests. I think that if we're not doing that, you know, we're really missing the boat by not having that encouragement uh, that you're going to get from people that are doing the same stuff that you are, knowing the struggles that you're going to have, uh, knowing the victories that come with this. So I would encourage you to get involved in your local filmmakers groups. And if you don't have one, start one. Why not you? You know, just start something might start off with one or two of you, you know, and it'll just grow. Uh, people get excited about that type of stuff and they want to be there. But I got a ton out of uh, just meeting these people that are doing different projects. Everyone's got some sort of different niche. and It's just really cool to be able to add contacts to your list and more importantly, uh, start making some friendships. So I highly encourage you get out there, get into your local meetups. Uh, get into whatever groups are available for you in your area. And like I said, if there isn't one, it's time for you to start one. And just a quick heads up here. We did have some minor technical difficulties with our conversation here. What Ella has to say is worth a little bit of echo back that uh, comes every once in a while. But it's definitely worth the price of admission. So we'll keep our little chat here short this week. And we'll just dive in. Here is our conversation with Ella Anderson. And now our feature presentation. Welcome to the show, Ella. Hey, thanks for having me. You betcha. So you got a new short film. Are you releasing it right now? You know what? It's uh, coming 2016. That's what I can say right now. Okay. We're sort okay. of in uh, the post-production slash marketing phase. Awesome. So awesome. Uh, hopefully in a few months, we'll be able to um, screen it uh, locally, meaning Seattle area. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, then we'll be submitting to festivals, hopefully. Fantastic. And the name of the movie is? Jesse's Theory. Cool. Cool. Uh, so your backstory is a little maybe crazy, would you say? Yeah, it's you just different. Say- yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, everyone has a different backstory, but yeah. mine is uh, in particular because um, I didn't come from a filmmaking background. I actually studied music and French in school. Uh, so I'm a flutist. I, oh. I'm a classically trained flutist. And then I decided to um, be a filmmaker. So <laughs> that's that's the short version. <laughs> How do you go from flute to film? You know, it's actually not so many. Uh, it's not so hard. There's very few steps in between. Um, actually, especially since I'd always really been into, uh, theater and, and acting and just like being on a stage, like that was always really fun for me. And so, um, when I moved to Budapest and this was after I graduated, uh, in 2013, I decided to move to Budapest because, um, I just really wanted to expand my horizons and live abroad again after I had studied abroad in France. And uh, Budapest was like such a unique city to me. And it was really great that I moved there because I met all these really cool people. And I got into theater and I took this like English uh, speaking theater class. And from there, that's where I met um, Lee Cross and Camila Barberis, who are my co-stars and co-producers of the film. Uh, Because we just really loved acting and wanted to continue doing that after the the play that we were in was over. So Camila did have, um, she has her BA in video production uh, or filmmaking actually. So that was really helpful. She really like guided me through the process as the as the director, you know, and so yeah. it's really learn as you go sort of thing. But I found that I really loved um, directing. You know, I got into it because I wanted to be to to act more. But I found that directing really suits me. So, well, yeah. I, I'm interested what it was like being a, in Bulgaria because that seems like such a different place. If you were to choose a place to go make a film, you'd think of like France, Italy, something like that, maybe London. Yeah, Budapest is sort of, it's like once you're there and you're like with other people and you ask, how did you get there? Everyone sort of has the same story as me, besides the students who are like in Erasmus or whatever. It's like, why did you come to Hungary? It's like, well, 
it's really cool and unique. And, you know, the language is actually not even Indo-European. Hungarian and Finnish are in their own, like, language group. Yeah. And it's not related to, you know, anything Latin or Greek. So yeah. <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah. Um, and, like, I found everyone is, like, really uh, open to – so when I was there as a, as a tourist, everyone seemed, like, really – um, welcoming and um, it was just really fun because they would you know help me learn phrases in Hungarian and mm -hmm. the city itself is just so beautiful it was just you know unlike any other place I'd been to. We were talking recently that uh, I'd, I'd been in Albania this last year doing mm -hmm. some video work there and it was the same thing where they have their own language it doesn't derive from anything yeah. and so you, you just get that unique experience of being in this place that's unlike any other. So yeah. uh, that's exciting that you got to do that. So when you went to make the film and you're setting up set locations and whatnot, was it difficult for you making that happen since you weren't, you know, using the home court, so to speak? You know, yeah, definitely. Like in retrospect, in retrospect, I, I can laugh about it a lot because um, <laughs> like it was difficult, but I mean, it wasn't impossible. There was just a lot of, uh, the only way I ever accomplished anything in my life was by talking about what it, what I wanted to do. And then eventually, you know, it, that would reach the right person who could actually help me do that. So, um, so when it came to making a film, I would just say out loud to whoever, like, oh, I need to find locations. And um, eventually, you know, through this trail of, of people, like through ads on the filmmaker group in Budapest and through um, friends of friends, they found the right people who could help me with that. And with my like broken Hungarian, I went to, we had to get like these maps as part of the location permit um, mm -hmm. acquisition process, I guess. And I, I'm pretty sure I sounded like a, like a robot with terrible grammar in Hungarian. <laughs> when I went there, I was like, need map fourth district <laughs> filming like this date. And somehow I like magically got what I needed. <laughs> it was fantastic. And then, but I did have um, a few other people on the crew who uh, could, you know, were Hungarian and could help me translate when it coming to other permits. I know talking about getting like location permits is probably like the least exciting thing in filmmaking, but to me it was so awesome because just like I had no idea what I was doing and I like managed to do it. And it was just yeah. like after, you know, several trips to the mayor's office or wherever it was and miscommunications and all that, like we finally got it. And of course we didn't need it in the end because no one checked on the day of filming. <laughs> That's neither here nor there. Okay. Yeah, but maybe if you had not gotten those permits, they would have checked. So it's exactly. always better safe than sorry. That, yeah, that's what I said. And that's that's sort of funny. That's like the premise of uh, – that's like Murphy's Law, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. So I, I'm really proud of you for taking that chance because I know it would have been – it's hard enough to do your first film where you're comfortable, you know, as people speak your language and you can communicate – to go somewhere and do it like that, that's just totally awesome. I love that. Yeah. Well, the cool thing is, is like, you know, I was already there. I was living in Budapest at the time, and it's like, okay, I want to make this film, and I'm here now. As opposed to, like, I want to make a film in Budapest. Let's fly to there, which mm -hmm. would have been really grandiose and awesome. But uh, <laughs> Or wait till you get home. You know, that would right. be the, the yeah. other option. And now that I am home, you know, to, and um, I'm actually from Oregon, and I've moved to the sort of Seattle area now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just really getting acquainted with the community there, which, you know, turns out to be awesome. You know, people like yourself and who are just really willing to um, give up, give great advice, even if they've never met you. Like, mm -hmm. um, I'm finding it's going to be, I think it's going to be really awesome. We have some cool projects ahead of us. That's great. So if I'm tracking right, you go from Bulgaria to Seattle. Seattle's also a place you didn't live before. So you you just like going where you haven't been. <laughs> You know, Hungary is not so different from Seattle. I mean, no, it, it, it is. There's, there's definite uh, cultural differences that I could go on for a while about. But um, all in all, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty cool experience. But no, I, my family is actually from uh, the Seattle area, awesome. um, like my grandparents. And now I have some other family up there, which is why I decided to move there. I was like, oh, you know, I've been in a foreign place for long enough. I could I could afford to be somewhere where I know, where I know people. So. That's great. So what was it like uh, when you went to actually put the team together when you're looking at putting a production crew in the, in the foreign land? It was, very, it was very motley the way we did it. Um, the, like, so my friend knew about these uh, you know, groups on Facebook, like the filmmaking ones, and she helped me post like our ad, like a, we had a call uh, or an ad for like, you know, come be on our crew. It's going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, so that got a few people and just after, and we posted it in some school uh, bulletin boards, like where they had the film school there. 
And so we got a few uh, film students on it, which was great. Like my art design guy, Kristoff, who really helped me with like all aspects of it, really. You know, in a very small crew and independent film, like everyone has their titles, but sort of everyone does kind of everything. And um, it was kind of like that it was great. There was actually one guy who um, saw the ad. He didn't he hadn't been uh, in the film crew before, but he just wanted he just wanted to jump in and it appealed to him okay. and he helped us with like script supervise script supervision and um just like whatever else and it, it was so cool to just like bring all these people from from everywhere together because um i made them you know i sent them the script and i made them read the script before deciding if they wanted to like be uh, a part of the crew or work on it because that was important to me that like you know no matter what part of the crew you're on whether you're you're the, the DP or, you know, the gaffer or whatever. Yeah. Like, I want you to be excited about the story we're telling because, like, no matter what role you have in the crew, if if you have that passion there and excited about it, you're going to make it the project so much better. No, I, um, so, I agree so it's, 100%. Yeah, it, it, and it was amazing. And I just am so – I'm just so happy about that whenever I think about that. Like, we got this really awesome group of people together. And, uh, you know, and we, mm-hmm. we definitely came up with them, uh, overcame a few obstacles of our own. We had planned four shooting days. And we had to add on a fifth one because um, the day we were shooting outside the playground scene, it was snowing and it was just, it was freezing. It was terrible. So we could only shoot the last scene there. And so it was like, okay. The, and the first scene was originally supposed to be there as well. And so we didn't have enough time and uh, sunlight and lack of snow and everything. So I just really quickly was like, okay, we'll do it in a restaurant somewhere. And uh, everyone was great. It's like, yeah, I'll rearrange my schedule. Fifth day of shooting, no problem. And um, that turned out to be really great. That's awesome. And that kind of ties in with a question that one of your friends had. You reached out to your friends, and uh, Nicole asked, uh, as a writer, did much change while you were on set? Yeah, and I love this question because, yes. like, <laughs> um, Definitely from day to day, there was, just, there was always a few changes on, to the script, which is pretty you know, uh, normal for filmmaking. Mm-hmm. It's like you have the idea of how it's going to look, and then it comes the time to actually, you know, do lights, camera, action, and, like, maybe it's not going to work exactly like you thought it would. Mm-hmm. And so you have to, like, always be thinking on your feet and changing things so it'll actually um, come across well. So as a first-time director and having your script, and you you might think going in that it's all going to run according to plan, did that uh, affect you in any way? Was it surprising to you? Uh, how, how did that affect your psyche? Yeah, pretty much 0% of it went according to plan. <laughs> um no no the, the, there were a few really good moments like I really liked how did that affect my psyche wow you know that's a funny question too because the the film is really centered on uh this girl who um has as a few different neuroses to to work out mm-hmm. so how did how did that affect my my psyche <laughs> was your question um I sort of thrived on it actually I mean I really love environments where I can where you like need to constantly be thinking and changing and problem solving. Mm -hmm. And although it wasn't ideal because of course it's so easy to get attached to the idea you had in your head for a long time. And like, if you're forced at the last minute to change it to something else, it it can sort of be disappointing at the moment, but um, more than once I can tell you that I think it worked out for the best. Um, For example, like the, another example of the locations that we didn't secure until like the very last minute, literally the day before we did not have a location for like the final climatic scene uh ended up being in this um bookstore that i loved i'd been to before it was in my neighborhood is this english uh mostly english books bookstore and um i just walked in the day before and was like hey can we film here (laughs) (laughs) and uh, as luck would have it we could and so i think that location worked out really well um and we sort of had to make the shot list really quick uh beforehand at first, I had pictured it being in sort of um, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, uh, and it had this big, you know, stairwell thing, and I could mm. work lots of like up-down movements and um, ge- sort of geometry and that sort of thing. But uh, it came out differently, and I, I, I really like the way that scene looks. Um, also, we went to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, which uh, <laughs> at the moment we went there, they were actually having the world science forum which just happened to be in budapest of course (laughs) which is great so we got these great shows of like these great shots of um like a light show uh flashing on the on the academy on the building which i don't think we used in the film but just just so you know that's like the way my life works out sometimes (laughs) like you know you go there and it's like oh we need to get some test shots here's a beautiful light show on the hungarian academy of sciences like 
anyway, we went there and we asked them and they wouldn't let us film because it was a, it was a fictional film, you know, it wasn't about an actual scientist there or um, someone at the academy. So, oh, well, and we tried out um, some other places like Central European Uni University that we could sort of fake as the academy. But in the end, it was the bookstore and, you know, hashtag no regrets. Am I right? Yeah, sure. So then you just kind of use the bookstore as like the school library or something like that. Is no, that... it literally, we just used it as the bookstore. Oh, okay. It's like, so okay. Jessie's, Jessie, totally like, changed the script then. Yeah, it's like she walks, she walks into a bookstore because she likes to read books. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And Perfect. I really love, and this is another thing, like, I sort of like to pay attention to, like, everything, like, um, costumes and set design and stuff, which we had, you know, limited resources for. But in the bookstore, I love it because you have all these books to choose from as, like, the ba things to put in the background. And we were in the... Um, science section <laughs> luckily uh and so we there's like these books by you know there was stephen hawking's um book uh, brief history of time and like einstein and fromer and all this stuff and uh abominable science so we sort of decorated the background during mm -hmm. this um this uh scene she has with dr hammerstein if you look at anything i do if you look in the background like there's the main thing that's happening and then you look at the background that's where the joke is for me nice what what's the total length on your film do you know that yet yeah, it's looking like it's going to be between 15 and 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, so, so sort of like if you binge on Netflix for a while and you want a little like, uh, you know, cleanse your palate a little bit, mm -hmm. watch Jesse's Theory, get back at it. <laughs> so a uh, question that I had also was, since this was your first time taking on a film, I'm assuming this would probably be your first screenplay. What was your writing process like? Yeah, the writing process. That's a fantastic question. Um, it's actually, so it's actually not my first time I've like written something and performed it. The first okay. like real uh, bit, you know, performance thing that I did was uh, actually on stage and it was for my thesis at the University of Oregon. And I wrote something called The House of Postcards, which was a, I called it a performance memoir, which was about time in France. And I just sort of, um, I wrote spoken word poetry and I performed it. And at the same time I wrote music. Uh, so I played the flute a little bit with um, six other musicians. Oh, cool. And so that was sort of uh, a writing and directing endeavor. But, um, yeah, not for the screen. And so, and I've always uh, written, like, short stories and stuff. But, again, not screenplays. Yeah. So what Was happened, this your first time writing dialogue? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was definitely my first time writing uh, anything of this sort. So screenplay with dialogue as opposed to my House of Postcards thing, which was based on my own real experiences okay. and more like poetry huh? basically it was, it was sort of simple in a way because lee and camila came to me and were like we want to make a film i was like great i'll write a screenplay mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just sort of um, me writing down things that i thought were hilarious for a while and just sort of like cracking myself up as i yeah. wrote down like this bit these bits and pieces of dialogue and um then i shared it with lee who was helping me develop it in the beginning and he was like you need you need to have a plot <laughs> I was like, that's, that's great advice and so I went to back to something that I had written in um, like six months prior to that. This was January of 2015 that I had written like this monologue. And this is where we get to the the drama part of the, it's, I consider it sort of a dramatic comedy, but sort of like a dark ish comedy, mm -hmm. I guess. Cause I, I lean more heavily on the comedy side, but I guess the drama part comes from actually it's comes from my real life experience. This one moment, um, I sort of have this monologue that was a response to an email I had received um, from the flute teacher that I had been working with while uh, in Budapest. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he was, uh, I hadn't seen him for two months because he was off in a different country. I don't know. And uh, two months later, I asked him, like, oh, can we have lessons again? And he responded with something like, you know, totally un un unsolicited because I hadn't said anything like I want to apply to schools. But he knew that I was working towards maybe going to graduate school for a flute performance. And he said something, you know, something really devastating that you should never say to a student. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I don't want to, you to think that you're going to be good enough to do this or something. Wow. Uh, to, to paraphrase. Yeah, I know. Some heavy, hard hitting stuff like yeah. that. And, you know, if that had come from a different teacher that I had worked with longer, or if I had perhaps been a more, more insecure musician mm -hmm. or person, that probably would have been more de devastating than it was but at the time i just knew it was something it's like okay this is like a toxic person who doesn't understand that you need to encourage people <laughs> if you want them to grow in their art mm -hmm. um yeah and so i was like okay theoretically of course i didn't respond to him because if <laughs> you just you just can't win that sort of conversation yeah, sure. and so 
I wrote this monologue, that would be a theoretical response to it. And it sort of grew and grew and I sort of made a fictional story out of it. Wow. And so I sort of sliced that down and took just a little part of that to put in, um, to be basically the plot, the turning point in Jesse's theory uh, and sort of turned it into a, like a what if scenario and um, sort of twisted it on its head. And it's sort of like the last straw for Jesse. And so, so yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> wow. I, I think there's actually a lot of life lessons in that, Ella, where you took what was a negative and instead of reacting in the way that most of us would like to, which would probably be, you know, not very good, <laughs> you decided to turn that into a positive. You wrote it out. You know, you didn't know what it was going to come of it, but then it turns out that it becomes, you know, your first film, which you could have never expected. And this, and that's the thing is like I knew it could have been anything. Like I was going to write a film anyway, and it could have been about anything, mm -hmm. you know. But um, it's something that I had known for a long time as like a music student, not just. Uh, because as a, at the college level, but just also bringing it when um to Budapest, like anyone everywhere, not even just students, but any at any whatever level you are pursuing your art or your passion, no matter how much positive feedback you have, you always see like other people doing doing better than you, and it's not like you envy them for that. Of course, it's like you want <laughs> beautiful art to be in the world, but it's like oh when will when will that come for me? You know, and so it's like. I would see all my classmates like practicing, practicing so much and be like midnight and we'd get out and be like, oh, I practiced so hard today. It was great. I played a million scales. I nailed my concerto and played all memorized all while standing on top of my head. And then you go to like a concert the next day of like, you know, one of your teachers or a guest artist or something. And it just blows you away because they're fantastic. They're just mm -hmm. phenomenal. And you're like, hmm, maybe I should practice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like this really long, I mean, obviously learning how to be a professional musician or anything it just takes a lot of time it's like this really long process of every day you know during that you always have this question in your head like until you get there and most artists or musicians you know there's no like no one hands you a certificate it's like good job you're a professional musician now it's sort of like you decide that for yourself mm -hmm. like it's your first paying gig or you set up your studio or whatever it is mm -hmm. and um anyway so <laughs> long story short <laughs> it's um this film is sort of an homage i guess to all my all my friends who who were like that too who i mean they're so talented and they work so hard um you know and i say they as though i'm not included in that group of people which is <laughs> but it's just like you know it's a process you'll get there you're doing what you can and um i think just there's this a lot of no matter what a positive front you put out like yeah. everyone there's like all the all these those superstars in music school or something yeah. uh where it's like oh yeah you can see that person's gonna go far yeah. but like even that person i can you guarantee you they're going to have that sort of evil voice in their head and sure, so sure. yeah so this this film is sort of an exploration exploration of that of like what goes on underneath like what you say to yourself in the mirror and how you fight back i really love that elif because that's something that i can totally relate to i had an experience when i was in high school where the school counselor told me i might as well go to work at the mill because i was always going to add up to and <sighs> you know so you have these people that are going to just be talking smack and they don't know and honestly, you know, when I look back at it, I don't know where that counselor was in her life. Obviously, she wasn't living her dream. So why should she expect anyone else to live theirs? So, <laughs> well, yeah, ultimately, we do have to uh, go on the forgiveness track. But I, I love how you've taken that and turned it into something so positive. So kudos yeah. to you for that. Yeah, and I really wanted to, and that can be, like I said before, it can be sort of a heavy subject depending on how, you know, how you take the, the devastating news, yeah. whether it's from yourself, because, you know, it's, and it's true, you are your own worst critic. That's generally true of um, people like, people like me, people like you, you know, art, artists, basically, or anyone who wants to, you know, get to the top of their field. It's like, you know, until you get there, you're just going to be really hard on yourself because, you know, it's not exactly what you had envisioned. Well, let, let me ask you this, because this wasn't on my list, but for me, comedy has always been a, a great way of healing some of those hurts. So when you were writing out your jokes, did you have that in mind or was it just going off of just pure funny? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, and that's what I was going to say is like com the comedy element sort of comes a lot more naturally to me than sort of this hard hitting drama aspect of it. Same and here. so, <laughs> and, because, and you know, cause it's like, I don't want that. I don't want the negativity to win, of yeah. course. So I, I tend to play that down, but there, there is, there are a few, um, you know, dramatic enough moments that we, I think we can call it a dramatic comedy. And I really like that because mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it shows the character of Jesse as being like really complex and flawed. And it's not just a matter of like, oh, I think poorly of myself, but I will choose to rise above. It's like, there's all these different, <laughs> I'm going to say neuroses again, because I like that word, neuroses at play that she sort of has to battle. And even in, um, in sort of facing them, she doesn't do it in the most elegant or graceful way, but just in a really visceral human way. Yeah. And to me, even that is really funny. But yeah, when I was like writing, and it wasn't a matter of like writing jokes, like I'm going to write, write a comedy. I will write jokes now. It was more of like just the way, like the way I write is how I speak to myself in my head mm-hmm. is just like making jokes all the time as though someone is there like laughing and yeah. wait, waiting to laugh at my joke, you know? I, I and totally just, relate. Like, yeah, just like really tongue in cheek, like stuff like that. But where I got a lot of my um, inspiration for the comedy of this particular film mm-hmm. is uh, from the style of sort of awkward comedy, I call it, from Dan in Real Life okay. with uh, Steve yeah, Carell. I love that and- movie. Oh my gosh, I love that movie so much. Uh, because it's yeah. so so fantastic. It just gets a lot of its comedy from like these moments that would be super awkward if you were there in the room to feel the tension. Yeah. That as an audience member, you can just really enjoy that it's someone else that it's experiencing. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of dramatic irony. There's a little yeah. bit of just sort of uh, tense glances and stares and, you know, sipping of your mug and turning away and... Um, there's some of that and then then there's the dialogue which i wrote which is that i mean the dialogue that i wrote is also just a little bit absurdist bordering on like like just like why would you say that um one of the clips uh we have some you know promotional clips that we're going to release and uh one of them is like yeah tell tell me what tell me what you're really afraid of and uh jesse says oh you know just spiders crawling to my mouth when i sleep falling from my (laughs) height dying alone oh and bees he says is that all and jesse says well specifically dogs that when they bark shoot bees at you from their mouth why would that happen jesse says why would any of those things happen and um seriously though why would any of those things happen sure and it's sort of like that like i guess that's a little bit of sad comedy right there for you but um <laughs> it's just like you know poking fun at your worst fears and yeah. and that's always fun i love that <laughs> We're definitely on the same wavelength when it comes to uh, just taking the crap of life and having fun with it because it's either that or, or get depressed. <laughs> so Yeah, it's really just a matter for me is like not taking it too seriously. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. You know, the, I think it was John Cleese who said, yeah, it was definitely John Cleese who said this, like there's a difference between being serious and being solemn. Mm. And uh, he's like, Ser- you know, you can talk about serious subjects, but be laughing all day. But solemnity, I don't know what it's for. <laughs> And uh, and it's true. So I just sort yeah. of I took this approach. And you're not downplaying the hurts of life, because you know we we can't sugarcoat that there is just pain in life. But yeah. we can. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. I was uh, talking with a friend like late last night. Her mom just passed away. She's having a hard time. I said it's too bad we can't just get together and have a good cry, you know. And she yeah. said, uh, Yeah, I wish we could, you know. So I sent her a clip of this film that I did a while back, and. And it's just me crying and, and it was a comedy and, you know, and it gave her a laugh. So to be able to give that to somebody that's in that, that moment of pain, even, and I told her, you know, I, I know that there's nothing that I can do to, to make this better. It's just something that we have to go through, but yeah. at least we can share a laugh, you know, and, and try to work through it that way. Yeah. That's, that's totally, I mean, that's just essential for me. And yeah. I, th- I think for anyone looking for a, a good comedy or, you know, a good film, a, a good book or anything, the key there is like catharsis to go back to, you know, high school English literature terms. Um, but in all seriousness, I think um, the way that this can be a comedy uh, by exploring such uh, an important subject to me, that of insecurity and, you know, self-doubt, is that you can sort of turn it on its head and be like, well, why? And sort of find the absurdity in it and be able to, you know, um, not take it so seriously. But, it, um, but in the end, sort of giving it its due and sort of recognizing it for what it is. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it was really important that to find the sort of cathartic moment in this film that I use everything like the I, like me, myself, the writer, uh, would was sort of just like laughing at myself. So there's a lot of Ella in this film, like mm-hmm. my humor and just sort of like the way I would <laughs> re- react to a lot yeah. of different yeah. scenarios. Yeah. Well, I don't think it would be as authentic if it wasn't really you, the writer, the the director, feeling those. You can you can tell sometimes when a director doesn't understand the joke, you know, or something like that. Yeah. No. And well, and the other thing besides 
just the comedy of the dialogue is that um since i knew i was going to be directing a film for the first time i was like okay time to study so i went to the internet to uh study how to be a filmmaker <laughs> google how to direct a film no so I, there's a lot, a lot of great um you know uh, videos on youtube like yeah. the channel every frame of painting which i love does these great video essays about um analyzing um, film form. So I really love the the comedy of Edgar Wright, like how you can get, get a joke from simply the camera angles or like panning out, mm -hmm. people exiting frame or entering frame in a funny way. And I'm super proud of myself because it might have been, been on accident, it might have been on purpose, but I definitely got in one of those sort of Edgar Wright trademark things into oh, that's it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, just so, so you keep your eyes peeled for how I imitate a fantastic film director. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to see this. This is gonna be awesome. I watched the uh, the outtakes reel that you have on your website. That was great. And it just showed that you guys were having fun. And I think that's one of the biggest keys, if anything, to to a great director is just they let it the set be light and you guys just have fun. Yeah, definitely. There's oh, there's there's more outtakes where that came from, I tell you. <laughs> Another question that I had for you, Ella, was uh, what has been your marketing or sales strategy? My strategy is to Google how to market a film. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I, uh, so since it's sort of weird how this happened because, you know, I filmed in Budapest and the, and then immediately after filming or a few weeks after filming, I moved back to the U.S. Okay. And that was um, just a combination of reasons and things and timing, but we, we knew that that was going to happen, but we, we didn't want to not do the film. So we did it. Mm -hmm. And so it's what we're sort of, I have my, my people in the, in the Seattle area helping me out. I have uh, Kira Osborne and Karina Wolf, who are awesome, and they're helping me um, with sort of marketing and publicity. Awesome. And um, did you ask me what my strategy was? My strategy, yeah. <laughs> my, strategy, my strategy was to talk about it a lot. So we, we're going to start a crowdfunding campaign in the next, I think, week or so. Awesome. And so I've been preparing for that a lot and sort of researching, researching crowdfunding, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, we're going to raise about, or our goal is about $4,000, and that way we'll be able to pay our editor and our composer, okay. who are both fantastic, and I've worked a little bit with the editor already, um, and I've worked with the composer before on a project that he wrote and when I was um, playing flute at the UVO about six years ago, awesome. and he was uh, studying composition, now he's down in LA doing uh, exactly that, composing for films. So I called him, I was like, hey, I remember you wrote this really cool thing that I performed in one time. Do you want to write for my film? He's like, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, wow. Yeah, and I've heard his stuff, and I really like how he can really um, capture, like, the mood of a scene or really enhance it, you know? Yeah, and I, I felt like, Dan, in real life, since you brought that up, if you pull the music from that, it's going to feel more like a drama, but the music was really light and played to the comedy. So then you felt like the viewer that it was okay to laugh at some of the stuff that you might not be sure about. I love those those moments where you can like contrast it. You know, sometimes you need the music to fit exactly what the mood is, and sometimes you just need it there to be like comedy. Yeah. For example, yeah. there's a, one, something I like to reference is this episode of um, House. So House has been trying to figure out what's going on with one of the doctors, and he figures out that she um, had been uh, she had just signed the papers for her divorce, and mm -hmm. so she was upset for that reason. He was like, and he gave her a baseball bat and permission to basically just destroy the lab equipment and stuff <laughs> and so she goes around destroying lab equipment with a baseball bat and in the background morning has broken <laughs> that was just some comedy genius right there oh, that, yeah that is when if you pull that track then you're like oh this poor lady <laughs> well so one last question for you ella what's next for you after you get this thing marketed get you get it out what's there what's next for me is big. more filmmaking more filmmaking all right so you're going for the feature you're doing more shorts yeah yeah so after we get this um uh let's hope for a successful crowdfunding campaign mm -hmm. i think we're uh yeah so we're going for a seed and spark because it's um um, just for indie filmmakers. I think it's really cool. Oh, cool. And uh, after we do that, we're going to submit to all the festivals we can. I'm going to try to do a screening in Seattle. Ideally, and stay with me here, this is kind of ambitious, I, I would do a bi-continental screening like oh, wow. in wow. Budapest and in Seattle at the same time. And hopefully we could also combine it with a fundraising event for um, you know anti-human trafficking. Because oh, I did cool. that before when I was in Budapest, but it was with a concert, and I got people from the List Academy to to perform, and we did a awareness slash fundraising event. Oh, cool! So yeah, hopefully we can do that again. Um, 
but this time with films, uh, with you know screening different short films, and the price of admission is like donation to this charity. Um, I like that. That was like, so that's that's all in the future. That's just an idea I have that I've not implemented yet. So mm -hmm. <laughs> but after the, um, some more concrete stuff is I do have a few more screenplays in the works and um, much shorter screenplays like okay. that could be shot in a day. Um, one is a parody of French films called this French film I saw once <laughs> in, in loving, you know, a very loving parody. And the other is called uh, The Pretender. And it's about, and typical of me, I guess I like to explore foreign countries and ideas and stuff. But one girl goes off to France and she loves to be, she has invisible props, like an invisible cigarette. She likes to play with a lot. And uh, it's just, you know, another exercise in absurdist comedy, I guess. Yeah. Well, I love that you're you're just going down the track of what's funny to you and trusting that it's going to find its audience. Yeah, totally. I'm sure there's people out there because I know I've met them. <laughs> I'm, I've met the people who laugh at me. Well, they were, they were working with you. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, if you're laughing with me, we can make this work. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, Ella, this has been awesome. We'll make sure that uh, everything's in the show notes over at uh, DocKennedy.com. Hey, just a quick ask. If you enjoyed this conversation, would you please share it with your friends, share it with people that you know could get something from this? That's how the word gets out. That's how this thing grows. And it's a lot of free work on my end. So whatever you do to help share these episodes is greatly appreciated. And if you want to leave an iTunes review, that is also appreciated. That helps us just gain more recognition in the iTunes search engine. So have an awesome week. I look forward to talking to you soon. Go and grow.